Hey, praise the Lord and greetings to you once again in Jesus' name. This is Brother Clinton. It is the sixth day of the week, the 12th of May, the year of our Lord, 2017, 5777. I have no idea where I'm going to start with this or how this is going to unfold, but this has been on my heart for a couple of hours now, resonating in my heart, and this message has to come forth. The majority of those of you who have clicked on this video clicked on it because of the title, and I rejoice for that. And I don't mean for the title or the message in this video to be a source of contention, uh, because that's not what this is about. I am a Christian, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle and apt to teach and easy to entreat, as the scripture says. And so I strive to be. But I titled this video the way that I did to catch the attention of many of you because as it is written in the scripture there are many people in the churches today who fit into the category of the angel of the church of the Laodiceans and they say we are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing but know not that they are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked and so Jesus says I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and I salve that thou mayest be able to see. And there are the vast majority of people in the Christian, so called Christian churches today, are lost. They're lost and hellbound. And, and, you know, there's videos on this channel to testify of that fact, and it is a scriptural fact. It's not just one scripture taken out of context, it's the whole of scripture taken in context. Uh, throughout all of history, most of the people, the vast majority of the people that professed to be the children of God were all actually children of the devil. And Jesus Christ made that manifest when he came in the flesh and said, Year of your father the devil, and the works of your father you will do. And that's the thing, that's the whole point. Okay, That's the whole point of this message. There are many of you in the churches who are, and I'm not speaking against you, I'm speaking for you. I'm here to build you up, not tear you down. Okay, um, the word of God is 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 a good thing to them that hear it, and it is a stumbling block to them that don't. So, how, however you receive this word, that depends on what manner of man or woman you are. That depends on what manner of heart resides in your breast. But the word of God is the same forever, and God is love, and this is a message of love to those who have ears to hear. So, why is it that so many people in the churches? have the Holy Ghost, but they never get saved, all right? That's the question at hand at this time. You might as well have a seat because this is going to take a few minutes to explain. There are many, 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 many people in the churches. Uh, did I say many? There are many, 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 many people in the churches who believe that receiving the Holy Ghost makes you a, a Christian, that it makes you saved. The reason that they believe that isn't based on anything in the scripture, it's based on the misuse of a few verses of scripture by lying theologians who have graduated from seminaries in order to deceive the people. Now, the, the, these lying theologians don't know that they're lying. They're deceived themselves, as the scripture says, deceiving and being deceived. And so uh, and that's what seminaries are for, to deceive people. Right? So all seminaries are for the purpose of deceiving people. All seminaries are owned and run by the Jesuits under the leadership of the Vatican, and they are there to, for the specific purpose of destroying the faith of Jesus Christ and cranking out pastors who have been lied to and deceived so that they will create congregations of people who are lied to and deceived. And these people teach these pastors and theologians and elders and bishops and deacons and, and so-called apostles and self-proclaimed uh, elders and all these, uh, these, these um, Nicolaitans, they proclaim to the people, among many other things, they proclaim to the people that when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that that makes you saved. And there are many of them that say that when you receive the Holy Ghost, that that makes you saved. Uh, and both of those statements are complete and total error. The first, of course, is ridiculous because there is no such thing as accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. The fact that so many multitudes of people believe that ridiculous lie in the churches is amazing to me because it's not written anywhere in the Scripture. No apostle of Jesus Christ ever heard of accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, much less spoke it to anybody. They couldn't have spoken it to anybody because they never heard of it. 
and nobody ever got saved from their sins by accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. No such thing was ever heard of by anyone until a little over a hundred years ago. Uh, but I digress, I could go into the story of that, but that's not important for this message. But there are many in those genres that say, or in that genre, that say that when you receive the Holy Ghost, that means that you are saved. And for that particular reason, people reject the biblical truth that baptism is for the remission of sins. Baptism in Jesus' name. All right, now, you may feel like turning off this video right now because you're convinced that baptism doesn't save you. And if that's what you want to do, that's between you and the Lord. But I am here to present to you the Word of God. I'm not here to argue with theologians, but to speak the Word of God. Because it is written, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. So if we're going to speak as the oracles of God, then we can't speak things like, baptism doesn't save you, it's just an outward showing of an inward change, it's just a, prof a public profession of your faith, uh, because those things aren't according to the oracles of God. So if we're going to be obedient to God, we can't speak those things. If we're going to be obedient to God, we should speak as the oracles of God. And the oracles of God proclaim that baptism is for the remission of sins and that it saves us. That's what the Bible says. right? So rather than saying what the Bible doesn't say and twisting things around to, to make uh, the Bible seemingly fit to our pretend doctrine, which takes a lot of energy, actually, why don't we just not say what the Bible doesn't say and be conformed to the Word of God, okay? Why, why don't we just do that instead? It's a lot easier, and it's a lot more fulfilling. So, having said that, there are a lot of people in the churches that have the Holy Ghost, or Holy Spirit, okay? For those of you who don't know, ghost and spirit are synonyms. They're two words that mean the same thing. They're interchangeable. Uh, they don't mean different things at all. The Holy Ghost is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Ghost is God the Father. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is the Holy Spirit. He is holy and he is a spirit. God is a spirit, the Bible says, and God is holy. This is why the scripture says, Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. So the only Holy Spirit there is, is God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why the scripture says in, in Luke chapter 1, verse 35, that the Holy Ghost is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Okay? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, doesn't have two fathers, you know, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, they're not both his fathers. They're not, it can't even say they're not, because there is no they. <laughs> because God the Father is the Almighty God. God the Holy Spirit is nobody. God the Holy Spirit doesn't exist. All right, it's a made-up deity. It was made up, uh, well, back, way back in, in, in the old days of paganism, and it was adopted by the Roman Catholic Church, and then eventually by all of her Protestant daughters. These gods called God the Holy Spirit and God the Son. But they don't exist. There is no God the Holy Spirit, and there is no God the Son. The Holy Spirit is in the Bible. The Holy Spirit is spoken of in the Bible. The Holy Spirit is God the Father. Right? The Son of God is spoken of in the Bible. He is the Son of God. He's not a God called God the Son. There is no such thing. So having said that, there are a lot of people that have the Holy Ghost, and they never get saved. Now, Brother Clinton, you've been talking for over eight minutes, and you still haven't gotten to the point. Okay. Here's the point, and it's still going to take me a few minutes to explain it, but I'm going to bring it to light right now. There are many in the churches that have the Holy Ghost, and because they have the Holy Ghost, they are convinced, because of the fact that they have the Holy Ghost and speak with tongues, and also because of the fact that their lying theologian pastors who graduated from seminaries have told them that baptism doesn't save you, they believe that they are saved because they can't imagine how God could give them the Holy Spirit if they weren't saved. You see, they don't believe that they're saved because of what the Bible says. They believe that they are saved because of the teachings that they've received from men, which are contrary to the Scripture. And because of those teachings, they can't fathom the fact that they're not saved because they speak with tongues, because they have the Holy Ghost. And they say, well, how can, I, how can you say I'm not saved when I have the Holy Ghost? I have Jesus Christ in me. I have the Holy Spirit in me. How can you say that I'm not a Christian? How can you say that I'm not saved? Well, I can say that, and I have to say that as a Christian, because it's my responsibility to judge righteous judgment and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. John the Apostle wrote this. The same Apostle that said God is love said, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. 
And the doctrine of Christ is the, the teaching of Christ, the teaching of who Jesus Christ is, what he came to do, and how we can be saved from our sins by obeying the, the, the gospel command that his apostles gave to the world. And that is that men are to repent and to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And this is why Jesus said to Nicodemus during the time of the Old Testament, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. All right? And I just did a video a little while ago about why so many people in the churches think that being born of water means to be born naturally and how ridiculous that is and that there's no scriptural basis for that at all. And the reason they believe that is the same reason that the, these people that, that have the Holy Spirit think that they're saved when they've never obeyed the gospel. It's not because they learned it from the Bible, because the Bible doesn't say that. It's because they learned it from their pastors, their professional pastors, who did just like doctors and lawyers and dentists do. They paid the money, they went to school, they got the diploma, they gave the correct answers that the school wanted, not the correct answers according to God, but the correct answers that the school wanted. They learned the things that the school wanted them to learn, and then they became a professional pastor. And then they either lease or buy a building and call that building a church and then put their diploma from the seminary on the wall and they start a business and they entertain people for money using the Bible. You see, that's what these professional pastors do. I don't care what denomination you belong to or if you call yourself non-denominational. If you go to a building that is called a church, somebody has to pay for that building. Somebody has to pay for that building. All right? It's not all paid for. And even if it was all paid for, somebody has to pay for the lights and the air conditioning and the heat and the plumbing and the water bill and, you know, and, and, and the, the PA system or whatever all things you have in there. Somebody has to pay for the maintenance for that building. And in order to pay for the maintenance and probably the lease or the mortgage for that building, then it's necessary that the pastor who owns that business or is the head of the CEO of that business has to entertain the people. If he preached the whole counsel of God, the whole Bible, then the people wouldn't come, and then the money wouldn't come out of their pockets, and then the pastor would have to go find a real job, you see, because this is how he makes his living. And so there are many, getting back to the point, there are many in the churches who have the Holy Spirit, but they have never gotten saved. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth in the Gospel of John. The Bible says that the Holy Ghost, when the Holy Ghost would come, that he would lead us into all truth. And so people, many people who have the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, they argue with one another about Bible teaching, and they all think that they have the truth because they said the Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth. But some of them say this, and others of them say that, and they all say different things. Well, if they all have the same Holy Spirit, then how is it that they're not speaking the same truth? Because truth isn't relative. You know, there isn't your truth and my truth. There's only one truth. Truth is absolute. Truth is what it is. Opinions can be relative, but truth is absolute. And so if we're all speaking the truth, then we're all going to agree. It's just that simple, boys and girls. And so people that have the Holy Spirit, or people that have the Holy Ghost, are not necessarily saved. Because although receiving the Holy Ghost is part of the New Testament baptism, it's not the complete New Testament baptism. The New Testament baptism, and what I mean by that is the baptism that the apostles preached and performed in the New Testament. Okay, the New Testament began 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost. That's when the New Testament began, as, as it was written in the law, and as it is recorded for us in the second chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And when the New Testament began, the apostles began to preach the gospel of the New Testament, and they preached a baptism. Okay, because the doctrine of baptisms, which is one of the principles of the doctrine of Christ, according to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2, goes all the way through the Bible, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And in the New Testament, there is a baptism. It is a baptism of water and spirit. Let me just share with you what Paul said about that in the book of Colossians, chapter 2. Come with me to Colossians, chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Well, let's read verses, um, let's read verses 8 through 12. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Isn't that what we were just talking about several times? Well, I say we. Isn't that what I was just talking about with you several times? And so he says in verse 9, For in him, 
in him, the word him is talking about Christ, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Period. Okay. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. What, what is Godhead, boys and girls? And when I say boys and girls, I don't mean to demean anybody. I'm just being a little, maybe a little bit facetious, you know, like, like uh, maybe Mr. Rogers would say, or maybe a kindergarten teacher would say, but I don't mean to demean you. I know that you're not kindergarten children. I just do that to kind of make you smile, and it's kind of a, an endearing term. Okay, so please don't get upset by that, like I'm trying to talk down to you, because I'm certainly not, all right? Because I'm certainly not better than you, whoever you are on the other side of this camera. But... What does Godhead mean, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen? Godhead is a singular noun that means God the Father. It means the deity. Godhead is a word that means deity, the deity. It, it doesn't mean three persons. It doesn't mean three anything. It's not plural. It has nothing to do with plural or three anything. It never did. And that's another one of the things that people misunderstand because they've been taught by their lying theologians that Godhead is a word that means the trinity. But there is no trinity, and Godhead is a singular noun that means the deity, and it is referring to God the Father, who is the only true and living God. You know, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, when he was praying in the 17th chapter of John, said, This is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Even as it is written, there is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So there is one God and one Son of God, the man, Jesus Christ. So it says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Now ye is referring to you if you have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you have been baptized in his name and filled with his spirit, then this word ye is referring to you. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised, Circumcised? Well, wait a minute, Brother Clinton. We don't need to be circumcised anymore. Circumcision is something in the Old Testament. Yes, but there is a circumcision for the New Testament. And it is the baptism of water and spirit. And that's what we're about to see. It's called the circumcision of Christ. And it's the same circumcision that God wanted all along. It's written about in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 10.16 and Jeremiah 4.4. Circumcise the foreskin of your hearts and be no more stiff-necked saith the Lord. That's the circumcision that he really wanted all along. Anybody can cut the foreskin of their, of their privy member, okay, but not everybody can circumcise the foreskin of their hearts, and those who can are the ones who are called of God, and the ones who are born of his word, and will eventually obey his gospel and be saved. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. Does that sound like remission of sins? Pardon, forgiveness of your sins? The putting away of your sins? Yes. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Circumcision of Christ. There is a circumcision of Christ. A circumcision of the New Testament. And this boys and girls, brothers and sisters, is how it works. Buried with him in baptism. You see, look at, look at verse 11 in the last se sentence. After the word Christ, there isn't a period there. There's a semicolon, which means it's not the end of the sentence. Okay? By the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. What is this? This is the circumcision of Christ. This is a baptism of water and spirit, buried with him in baptism, wherein, okay, what does the word wherein mean? In the sentence, it means in that baptism. It's referring to the baptism. It's referring to you being dunked under water, okay? It's that when it says buried with him in baptism, this is talking about being buried under water. It's not talking about receiving the Holy Ghost. It's talking about being baptized in water, buried with him in baptism, wherein also, in that baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Well, why, those of us who have the Holy Ghost, why do we have the Holy Ghost? Because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. If Jesus Christ were not risen from the dead, then we could not receive of his spirit. You see? But he is risen from the dead, and that's 
why we can receive the Holy Ghost. It is the first fruits of our inheritance. It, it is the earnest of our inheritance. And what is our inheritance? Eternal life, the resurrection. Why are we Christians? Because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead so that we no longer have to fear death because we have the resurrection. We have the promise of the resurrection in the future. How do we know that? Because we have the resurrected Christ inside of us. The Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ. What is the name of the Holy Ghost? His name is Jesus Christ. You see? Paul said, and Paul uh, called it the Spirit of Jesus Christ in Philippians 1.19. And Jesus Christ said, He dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Okay, well, who is that? Well, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. It was Jesus Christ saying, I am with you and I shall be in you. All right, now, he said in verse 12, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. This is the circumcision of Christ. This is the baptism of water and spirit. This is why Jesus said to Nicodemus during the time of the Old Testament in John chapter 3, verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Nicodemus didn't understand this. And Jesus said to him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? In verse 10, John 3, 10, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Don't you understand, Nicodemus, that the flood in the days of Noah was a baptism of water and spirit? Don't you understand that the crossing of the Red Sea, when your fathers crossed the Red Sea, passing through the sea on dry land, they passed through the sea and were under the cloud? Don't you understand that that was a baptism? Paul testified to that fact in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Don't you understand, Nicodemus, that when the children of Israel, your forefathers, went through the Jordan River unto, unto uh, Jericho on the other side? to begin to conquer the land that is now called Israel? Don't you understand that that was a baptism? Haven't you read in 2 Kings about Naaman, the, the Syrian leper, who came to the prophet in, in the land of Israel and was healed from his leprosy when he was commanded to dip himself in the Jordan River seven times? <clears throat> Can't you see, Nicodemus, that except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God? It's written all throughout the Scripture. And yet, there are so many in the churches brothers and sisters, boys and girls, men and women, there are so many in the churches who believe that they are saved when they have never obeyed the gospel. And they have the Holy Ghost and they speak with other tongues. And for that reason, they believe that they're saved because, number one, they have the Holy Ghost, and number two, their pastors, their lying pastors have told them that baptism doesn't save them, which is a complete contradiction to the Scripture. And they believe it. And I used to believe it too. The first couple of years that I was born again and serving the Lord Jesus Christ before I got saved, I believed that baptism doesn't save you. I really believed that. And one man, a Christian, challenged me on it one day. And, you know, I, I, I told him, I'm going to get in my Bible and I'm going to write down all the scriptures that I know to prove you wrong. And I'll, you know, I'll see you in a day or two or whatever. And I went into my, uh, into my little room and I searched the scriptures. And as I was searching the scriptures, the more I searched the scriptures... To prove that man wrong, the, the more the Lord showed me that he was right. And if people would just search the scriptures and see, you know, Jesus said, these signs shall, uh, he said, um, go ye therefore and, pre and teach. Hi. Um, okay, let me, I'm, I'm getting uh, gospels mixed up in my mind. I'm getting uh, 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 Mark and Matthew mixed up in my mind. So let me read from Mark chapter 16. Jesus said, um, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. All right. Now, there are those that, that will come to me and they will say, well, look, at, he said, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So it's just about faith. It's not about baptism, right? He didn't say, but he that believeth not and doesn't get baptized shall be damned. Did you hear what I just said? Those people... I say to them sometimes when they say that, did you hear what you just said? Why would Jesus say, but he that believeth not and is not baptized shall, shall be damned? Why, what a ridiculous thing to say. Of course you're not going to be baptized if you don't believe. But these people are just reaching for straws, trying to grab for anything to avoid having to believe what the Scripture says because they have been deceived by their lying pastors. They have the Holy Ghost, but they've never been saved. They have the Holy Ghost, but they've never been saved. And they go to Acts in the 10th chapter, 
where you know Peter preached at the house of Cornelius, and they say, well, well, uh, you know, those people in the house of Cornelius, they received the Holy Ghost, and they were saved before they were baptized. Oh man, if I had a dollar for every time somebody told me that, I'd have enough money to buy a nice house probably. Um, but you know, they they say this assuming for some reason that receiving the Holy Ghost means that you're saved. But the Bible doesn't say that anywhere. Now, of course, you're not saved. You're not a Christian if you don't have the Holy Ghost because the Bible says, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. But the Bible doesn't say or suggest anywhere that simply receiving the Holy Ghost without obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ makes you saved. But they assume that. They assume that because their lying pastors have taught them that because they have taught them that baptism doesn't save you. And they think that just because they speak with other tongues that they're saved. And they think that baptism is just a, a spiritual analogy, you know, and that baptism doesn't really mean being actually physically dunked under water. It just means, you know, being baptized by the word, they say. They think that uh, the word is water. I'll get into that in a minute because that's a ridiculous lie as well. It's, it's, it's so ridiculous that I'm amazed that anybody could actually believe it. But... You know, in the 10th chapter of Acts, as I was talking about a minute ago, it says in verse 44, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. That's what happens when you receive the Holy Ghost. Okay? Uh, and if I have time... Well, I can make time, actually. If I am led to make time, I want to talk about that a little bit as well. But I, I digress. I want to move on with this subject so I don't you know, go off on a tangent. But in verse 46, it says, For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Well, the people that argue with me about this imagine... Okay, they imagine, and, and I want to emphasize this, they imagine, because these things are not in the Scripture, they imagine that they, they received the Holy Ghost and were therefore saved, and then they got baptized. Well, there's nothing in the Scripture anywhere that would suggest that they were saved when they received the Holy Ghost. There's nothing anywhere in the Scripture. The only reason that they think that is because their lying teachers have taught them that. Okay, another thing that they err in, is they say, well, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which has received the Holy Ghost as well as we? They imagine that these people were baptized in water by uh, Peter and the other brothers saying, repeating the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and that their baptism wasn't for their salvation. It was just as an outward showing of an inward change. They imagine all this ridiculous nonsense because that's what they've been taught by their religious teachers who have graduated from seminaries where they were trained up by Jesuits to be deceived and deceive others. You see, but nobody in the Church of Jesus Christ was ever baptized by repeating the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, because if they were, they don't belong to the Church of Jesus Christ. They belong to the Church of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, whatever that is. But we're not commanded to be baptized unto the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We're commanded to be baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And of course, that name is Jesus Christ, and that's why when you see the apostles who received that commandment from the Lord, baptizing people all throughout the scripture, they baptize people in the name of Jesus Christ, because that's the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And whoever can't see that is just blind, because it's absolutely perfectly simple. A little child could see it, but the wisest scholars in the world will never figure it out. It's hidden in broad daylight. See, this is why Jesus said, I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. For indeed it was thy good pleasure to do so. So Peter said, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? All right, this is what the scripture says, and this is what happened. They were baptized. How were they baptized? By being submerged in water, as the scripture says. Why were they baptized? for the remission of their sins. Okay? How were they baptized? By calling on the name of Jesus Christ. Because the, this same Peter was the one who began to preach on the, on the first day that the New Testament began, in, in the second chapter of the book of Acts, and he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
You see, he didn't say, now let me tell you what he didn't say. Peter did not say, the apostle of Jesus Christ, ordained of God and the one who had the keys of the kingdom of heaven, did not say, repent and receive the Holy Ghost, every one of you, for the remission of sins and be baptized as a public profession of your faith. He did not say that. <laughs> nothing like that is written anywhere in the scripture. Okay, there's nothing in the scripture that suggests that receiving the Holy Ghost is something that will cause your sins to be remitted. Receiving the Holy Ghost does not get your sins forgiven. It does not get your sins pardoned. Being baptized in Jesus' name, if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and repent, then being baptized in Jesus' name is for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, there are some that received the Holy Ghost before they were baptized, like these people in the house of Cornelius, and also like me. I received the Holy Ghost four years before I was saved. Four years before I was baptized in Jesus' name. Why? Well, it's kind of a long story, but very simply, it's because, number one, I was in prison, and number two, I didn't come to the knowledge of the truth about the doctrine of baptisms and, and the gospel of Jesus Christ until about four years after I had received the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Spirit did lead me into all truth, because I was born of His Word. But there are many in the churches, many, 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 many in the churches who have received the Holy Ghost who have not been born again. What do I mean by that? The Bible says that we are born again by the Word of God. And those that are born of God hear His Word. As the Scripture says, we are of God. Okay, They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world and the world heareth them. We are of God, little children. He that knoweth God heareth us, and he that knoweth not God heareth not us. This is how we know the difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Okay, He that is not of God heareth not us. So there are many in the churches who have the Holy Ghost, but they're not of God. How can you say that, Brother Clinton? Well, I can say that because it's a fact. I mean, look at what, uh, look at what David wrote in the Psalms, uh, Psalms chapter 68, verse 18. Uh, thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men. Does that sound familiar? Paul quoted this in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. But let's read the rest of the sentence. Yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Wait a second. For the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them? What are you talking about, Brother Clinton? I'm saying what the scripture says. I'm reading it word for word. Let me read it again. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men. Yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Look back, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, into the days when Israel left Egypt. And they were in the wilderness for 40 years. Why were they in the wilderness for 40 years? They could have entered the promised land in a couple of weeks. But they didn't because they refused to enter and they refused to believe the word of God. And because of their unbelief, God swore in his wrath that they would never enter into his rest. So they wandered in the desert for 40 years until all that generation died, until their carcasses fell in the desert and they died. But you know what? Through all those 40 years, they were under a pillar of cloud by day and under a pillar of fire by night. And God rained manna from heaven every day, six days a week, and, and twice as much on, on, on the sixth day of the week, so that they could have on the Sabbath day uh, without having to gather. And he gave them water from a rock. He, he sustained them supernaturally for 40 years in the desert. In the desert. Nobody could survive more than three or four days in the desert. But God sustained these cursed people to whom he swore that they would never enter into his rest in the desert for 40 years. Their feet did not swell. Their clothes did not wax old. Their shoes didn't wax old on their feet. He sustained them in the desert for 40 years. They were partakers of the spiritual blessings. And the Bible says that rock was Christ. You know, that rock at Massa that poured out the water. This is why we sing, uh, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood, you know the song, Blessed be the name of the Lord. If you don't, you should learn it. Um, this is why we sing Rock of Ages, because these people drank from that rock. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, that rock was Christ. But yet they perished in the wilderness. They were cursed. God had told them they would never enter into his rest. And so it is in the churches today. 
boys and girls, brothers and sisters. There are people in the churches today who are filled with the Holy Ghost and they do mighty signs and wonders in the name of the Lord. And they heal the sick in the name of the Lord, but they will not be baptized in the name of the Lord because they deny the name of the Lord. They deny Him with their works. With their mouths they show much love, but their heart is far from Him. And they don't know Him and they refuse to be baptized in His name because they're convinced by their lying preachers that God is a trinity and that a baptism without the name of Jesus Christ is sufficient because baptism isn't for the remission of your sins anyway. And baptism has nothing to do with your salvation anyway. That's what they say. And they go to their thing called a church with a Bible under their arm week after week after week, and they never they can't hear the Word of God. Why, Brother Clinton, why? Why do all these people have the Holy Ghost, and yet they never get saved? Because they're not... Here's the, here's the answer, okay? I've been speaking for 35 minutes. Here's the answer. They are not born of God. They are not of Jesus' sheep. They're not born of God. They cannot hear the Word of God. They have the Holy Ghost, but they're not saved. And many of them will never get saved. And many of them will, will go through all their lives in their vain form of religion, speaking in tongues, prophesying in Jesus' name, doing many mighty works in His name, and they're going to die and go to hell. And on the day of judgment, they'll be cast out of hell to stand before Jesus. And, they, and then they will say, Well, Lord, we, 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 we prophesied in Thy name. We, we did many mighty wonderful works in Thy name. And He's going to say, You know what? I never knew you. I never knew you. You know, he's not going to say, I knew you for a while and you strayed from me, so sorry about that. He's going to say, I never knew you. Never. I never knew you. You were never mine. You were never called by my name. My word was never in you. You never abode in me. I never knew you. Never had a relationship with you. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. This is what most of the people in the churches these days will hear Jesus Christ say. These are the people that are filled with the Holy Ghost and are lost and are children of the devil. I'm not saying they don't have the Holy Ghost. I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit in them is the devil. What I'm saying is that they are of the devil. And they have walked into an anointing. Because you don't have to, all you have to do to receive the Holy Ghost is believe that God poured out the Holy Ghost. And walk into the anointing and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and begin to speak with other tongues. These people in mass are filled with the Holy Ghost, but the Holy Ghost is not leading them into all truth because they're not letting him, because they're not born of his word. They can't hear his word. To them, having the Holy Ghost is religious entertainment, and they're prideful and they're sinful, and they reject the word of God. They reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, just like the Pharisees that rejected the baptism of John. So do they. And therefore, they can't see. Let's go to Luke chapter 7 real quick. I just want to share something with you, and then, and then my intent is to close this video. Um, Luke chapter 7, verses 29 and 30, I think. Yeah, 29 and 30. It says, all the, And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God. Him is talking about Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ was preaching to them. It says, All the people that heard him and the publicans justified God, being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. Why? Why? Why was John baptizing? John was baptizing the people of Israel unto repentance for the remission of their sins. Mark chapter 1 verse 4. Let's read it real quick. Mark chapter 1 verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. John wasn't baptizing Gentiles. John didn't live during the time of the New Testament. He didn't preach any New Testament gospel. He was a Jewish prophet who was the last great prophet of the Old Testament who came to prepare the way of Messiah for the people of Israel. And he preached unto the people of Israel to repent and if they would be willing to repent and be baptized by him, then their sins were remitted. They weren't baptized into any name. They didn't need to be baptized into any name because they were already the family of God. They were already called by his name, Yitzchael. Yitzchael. They were already called by the name of the living God, Israel. They were his people. They were his covenant people. 
What they needed was their sins remitted so they could see their Messiah. Because sin makes you blind. You see, this is what Jesus said in the, in the, uh, in the ninth chapter of, of John. When he had healed that blind man at the end of the chapter, he said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, I love Jesus' words. He said, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say we see. Therefore, your sin remaineth. And when John was baptizing in the Jordan River, he was baptizing the people of Israel for the remission of sins, unto repentance for the remission of sins. And, and when they obeyed John's baptism, their eyes were opened because their sin was remitted, and they could see their Messiah. You see? And those people in the churches today who have refused to be baptized according to the, the preaching of the apostles of Jesus Christ, they refuse to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, then they have not received the remission of their sins. They're still in their sins. You see, their sin is still upon them. They're still guilty sinners on their way to a burning hell. Regardless of the fact that they speak in other tongues, regardless of the fact they have the Holy Ghost, regardless of the fact that they go to church, regardless of the fact that they read their Bibles, regardless of the fact that they may drive the Sunday school bus or teach the Sunday school class, or they might be the pastor of their denomination. Regardless of all those facts, they're children of hell. They're on their way to eternal destruction because they have refused to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And therefore, their eyes are shut, and this book is a sealed book. This book is a sealed book to them. They cannot understand it because they are blind and they, lay, they love rather the deception that they've been taught from seminary and that the pastors who have graduated from seminary have taught them and their denominations. And they love to say with all of their hearts, oh, you all think that you're saved by your works because we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. They say, well, that, you believe in a works gospel. A works gospel. I believe that when you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're saved. Now, if you want to call that a works gospel, that's, that's up to you. That's your opinion. You can work that out with God when you see him. But they spout out all these things, and they say, well, baptism doesn't save. It's just a public profession of your faith. It's not worth showing an inward change. Really? Really? Show me where the Bible says that, please. It doesn't say that. And they know that it doesn't say that. And so they just get upset when you bring this to them because they can't hear the Word of God. These people are filled with the Holy Ghost and they are not saved. And most of them will never be saved. Some of them may turn around and hear the Word of God at some point and repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Most of them will not. They'll say, you know, I was born a Baptist and I'll die a Baptist, by golly. Wow, well, that's pretty silly and that's a pretty foolish decision, but that's your decision. You know, if you were, you know, you were baptized without the name of Jesus Christ, and then they say, well, you know, I was baptized in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and, and I believe that we should do what Jesus said, not what Peter said. Really? Do you hear how ridiculous you sound? You're actually saying, you're, you're professing to be a Christian, you're actually saying that Peter preached the wrong gospel. The apostle of Christ, Peter, who had the keys of the kingdom of heaven, you're actually saying that he preached the wrong gospel, that he messed it up and didn't preach what Jesus told him to preach. And people will, will, will grab for straws and will make up such ridiculous nonsense that they, and, they, and not even be ashamed of it. All because they absolutely refuse to believe the scripture. And these are people in the churches. They call themselves Christians, and they absolutely refuse to believe the Scripture. And in order to keep themselves from having to acknowledge what the Scripture says, they will make up the most ridiculous lies that you have ever heard in your life. And this is because they are not of God. They are not of God. These are, this, this is the same generation that said to Jesus, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan, and that thou hast a devil? They said this to Jesus of Nazareth. They couldn't convince him of any sin. He had not committed any sin. And there was no evidence to believe that he was a Samaritan. And there was no logical reason for anyone to say that he had a devil. But they were so furiously trying to not hear 
the word of God, that they were willing to make up the most ridiculous lies and not even feel ashamed. And this is how the people in the churches do it. And they, and they have the Holy Ghost, brothers and sisters. They have the Holy Ghost. They speak with other tongues and prophesy. And it's not the spirit of devils that they have. It's the Holy Ghost. Some of them are faking it. Some of it is just emulation. Some of them in Pentecostal churches and other churches, you know, they they, uh, they teach them. They say, they, we'll teach you how to speak in other tongues, you know. And they just sit them down and, and they get them all excited. And they say, okay, now just say Jesus. And they say, Jesus. Okay, say it again. Jesus. Okay, say it now three times fast. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And go, and they, they say, okay, now say it as fast as you can over and over and over. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Okay, now you're speaking in tongues. And they, and they, people think that they're speaking in tongues when actually all that they're doing is, is an emulation. It's, it's, uh, it's a ridiculous form of pretending that you're speaking in another language when you're not, just because you don't have the Holy Ghost. And that's not really the subject of this video, so I digress from that. But there are people in the churches, many, many, many people in the churches, who have received the Holy Ghost. And they, you know, I've, I've known many of them to, to, to prophesy in Jesus' name, and those things come to pass. And to, you know, do miracles in Jesus' name, to heal people in Jesus' name. And that's a wonderful thing. And Jesus said not to forbid them, because whosoever can do a, a miracle in my name uh, can, no, can in no wise speak evil of me. But, although I do not forbid people to do miracles in Jesus' name, prophesy in Jesus' name, I do forbid people that refuse to obey the gospel of Christ to profess that they are Christians and to, and to fellowship with me or me with them, unless they consent to repenting and, and obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see. And so, having said that, I know I, was, I said I was going to cut this video off with the last uh, couple of verses of Scripture, but I have something else that I want to share with you, hopefully real quick. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 13, and I was just reading this a couple days ago, which is when the Lord began to stir this up in my heart. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, says this, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now, God willing, I'm going to close on this passage. Because this is, this is yes, I believe this is what God wants me to close. So let's concentrate on these three verses of the scripture. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. All right. Now God said this to the people of Israel, and he was talking about the people of Israel. He didn't say if any people of the nations around you, the Gentiles around you. He said if there arise among you, among the people of Israel, the church of God, or if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams. Oh, well, I had a dream. How many of those are there on YouTube? How many of those are there just on YouTube? Man, you could probably find hundreds or even thousands of people that say that they're Christians and say they had a dream from God. And you know, maybe two or three percent of them will be from God and they'll all be the same. But you know, the rest of the 97 or 98 percent of them are just crazy nonsense and foolishness. Um, because they don't know God. And they didn't get their dreams from God, although they think they did. Why? Because Satan comes as an angel of light. You know, Satan doesn't come to you, boys and girls, saying, Hey, I'm Satan. Let me give you this dream, and, and, and you can go around and tell the people that it came from God. You know, Satan doesn't do that. Satan comes as an angel of light. Satan comes pretending to be Jesus Christ. That's how Satan comes. Satan comes standing in the pulpit saying that he's a minister of the gospel. This is how Satan comes. He comes as an angel of light. Therefore, it's no marvel if his ministers also appear as ministers of righteousness. And so it says, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, hello, uh, those are little beetles that always kind of invade the house after it rains. It's, it's one of the great mysteries of life. No one seems to know where they are when it's not raining, but as soon as it rains, they all come out. Um, Anyway, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, okay, and the sign or the wonder come to pass. Now, let me just stop there for a moment. People in the churches have come to assume that if anybody gives a sign or a wonder, if anybody gives a prophecy or a dream, and then the prophecy or dream comes to pass, 
that that person is automatically considered to be a man of God or a woman of God. <clears throat> Anybody who has read through the Bible at least once should know better than that. You should know better than that. If you don't know better than that, I'm kind of scolding you right now as a Christian, as a man of God. You should know better than that. You know, kind of like when your mom used to look down on you and after you did something really stupid and when you were like five and she said, you should know better than that. You know, yes, I'm doing that to you. I'm not demeaning you. I'm just, I'm doing that to you. If you don't know better than that, you should. Okay. The fact that someone prophesies something and it comes to pass does not mean that they are a man or a woman of God. All it means is that they prophesied something and it came to pass. A spirit suggested something to them and then that spirit caused it to come to pass. It could be God or it could be another spirit. How do we know if a, if a man or a woman is of God? The Bible gives us the answer. If they abide in the doctrine of Christ. Remember I spoke to you from 2 John uh, close to the beginning of this video. I said, according from 2 John, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Okay? And then he goes on to say, If any man abide in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. So, people that abide in the doctrine of Christ are men and women of God. But people that prophesy or have a dream and the dream or prophecy comes to pass, they're not necessarily men or women of God. And that has deceived many people. And the Bible says in the last days there shall be many lying signs and wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness among the wicked. Let me just read that for you real quick. Hold your place in Deuteronomy and let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, chapter 2, forgive me. And let's start in verse 8. It says, and then, I'm in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Wicked with a capital W, which is referring to a human. It's the, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, Lucifer. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now wait a second. What did Deuteronomy chapter 13 say in verse 2, or verse 1? If, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth a sign or a wonder... 2 Thessalonians 2.9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now this is one of those amazing times when you can see clearly that it's impossible for men to have made up the words in this Bible because Paul is saying in, in 2,000 years ago the same thing that Moses said 3,500 years ago. The same thing. Why? Because it's by the same Spirit. Now look, let's go back to Deuteronomy 13. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, where if he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Now, Brother Clinton, what has this got to do with us in the churches today? Do you not know that Paul said that there are many Jesuses in the world. There are, there are many things that are called God and there are many Jesuses because Paul said to the, to, the, to the Corinthians that if someone comes to you and preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached and another spirit and another gospel, you might well receive them. There are many Jesuses. Brothers and sisters, there are many Jesuses. There's the Roman Catholic Jesus. There's the Mormon Jesus. There's the Buddhist Jesus. There's the Islamist Jesus. There's the Jehovah's Witness Jesus, and then there's the Lord Jesus Christ that we know and love, the Almighty God who came in the flesh. And all those Jesuses are different, and only one of them is the living God. The rest of them are just the imagination of men. And so, other gods, well, you might say, well, I don't, we don't worship other gods in the church. We only worship Jesus Christ. Really, well, if you worship the, the Roman Catholic Jesus Christ, which is a trinity of gods. Well, actually, I should say, if you worship the Roman Catholic Jesus Christ, which is a third of a trinity of gods, then you're worshiping another god, because your god doesn't exist, because your god is not my god. If you believe that Jesus Christ is God the Son, the second person of the trinity, then you and I are not worshiping the same god, because your god doesn't exist, because there is no God the Son, the second person of the trinity, 
that is a Roman Catholic deity that doesn't exist that was borrowed from paganism 1700 years ago. It doesn't exist. You see? And so if you have a dream or a vision and it comes to pass and then you say, well, I'm a man of God and you can see I'm a man of God because I got this dream or vision. Now I declare to you that Jesus Christ, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, says this and we should all follow him. You're a liar and you're an antichrist. And if I were living under the time of the Old Testament, I would be commanded to take you to the elders and have you stoned to death. But fortunately for you, because we're living in the time of the New Testament, I'm only commanded to, uh, to teach you, to present to you the Word of God. And if you are a heretic and if you reject the Word of God after the first and second admonition, then I am commanded to depart from you. And if you are among the church of God, then, then we as the church of God are commanded to put you out from among us and to turn you over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh with the hope that one day you will come to the knowledge of the truth and that the flesh may be saved in the day of, of Jesus Christ. You see? So in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 2, it says, And the sign of the wonder come to pass, where if he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them, Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or, listen to what God says, Thou shalt not hearken, do not continue to hear him. Proverbs 19, 27, Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth to err from the words of knowledge. Again, Proverbs 19, 27, Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth to err from the words of knowledge. When there is a prophet or a dreamer of dreams who prophesies something or dreams something and proclaims it, and then later on it comes to pass, and then he begins to preach a false god that doesn't exist and starts to try to draw you and other people away towards that false deity that doesn't exist, then you are to not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now, if you're holding your place in 2 Thessalonians, let's go back there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because why? Because why? Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. That's why. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Strong delusion. These are the people that are deluded, that will stand right in front of you proclaiming to be Christians, and they say, how do you say I'm not a Christian? I've got the Holy Ghost. Ba -ba 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 -da -da -ba I have the Holy Ghost. How do you say that I'm not a Christian? I don't need to be baptized. Baptism isn't for the remission of sins. But wait a minute, brother. The Bible says... Repent and be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins. Oh, it doesn't mean that. The word for doesn't mean that. For The word for means because of. And it's not. These are people that are under a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Why? Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause shall God, them, shall God send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in what, boys and girls? But had pleasure in unrighteousness. These are people that are lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. They love unrighteousness. They refuse to hear the word of God. They refuse to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, so they cannot hear the word of God. And they live in a strong delusion, flat out denying the word of God, making up lies that are not in the Word of God, and professing themselves to be children of God. Why? Because they don't love God. They don't love God. Saying you love God doesn't mean you love God. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And so back to Deuteronomy 13, verse 3, it says, Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And is that not the first and greatest commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. 
And secondly, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so if you love the Lord your God, then you will believe his word and you will reject the false prophets that prophesy in Jesus' name and then lead you after a false Jesus that doesn't exist or some other false God that doesn't exist. There is no God the Son. God the Son does not exist. There is no God the Spirit. God the Holy Spirit does not exist. There is only one God, the Father. And this is written all throughout the Scripture. I'm thinking particularly of 1 Corinthians 8, 6. For to us there is but one God, the Father. One God, the Father. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, when he was praying, said, This is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was praying to his Father, and he said of his Father that he is the only true God. There is no other true God. Only God, the Father. Why is he called the Father? Because he has a son. Okay? Duh. If I might, you know, speak in the language of children. Duh. Why is he called a father? Because he has a son. That's, that's the only reason someone would be called a father. Is either if they have a son or a daughter. And so, he says, Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now listen, verse 4. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in, so shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. This is how they put evil away from the midst of them in Israel. Now in the New Testament, this is the way we put evil out of, out of, out of our midst. We can see it in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 5. Um, and he says, well, I'm not going to read the whole chapter because I want to keep this short, but in the last verse, he says, therefore put away from your, among yourselves that wicked person. Okay, Deuteronomy 13, 5 says, therefore shall you put the evil away from among you. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 13 says, therefore put away from your among yourselves that wicked person. Paul didn't tell them in the church of Corinth to stone this wicked man, but he, he told them straightly to put him out of the church to put him out of the congregation. He says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And so he was telling them that you're, you're letting this man sit in your midst. You need to put him out. You need to let him know that that's not acceptable, and that he may not continue to have fellowship with you until he becomes your fellow. You see? This is judgment. This is how we do judgment in the church. And so... Boys and girls, brothers and sisters, there are many, 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 many people in the churches who have the Holy Ghost, and they are not saved, and they, many of them will never be saved. And the reason is because they refuse to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Simply receiving the Holy Ghost does not remit your sins. It does not make you saved from your sins. It does not make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the only way, the only way, brothers and sisters, the only way, there's only one way that the Bible speaks of in the New Testament, from the day that the New Testament began, 50 days after the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost, that's when the New Testament began. There is only one way for any living human being to receive remission of sins. And that is to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Remember, I'll say to you again, Peter did not say, Repent and receive the Holy Ghost for the remission of sins, and you shall be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as a profession of your faith. He did not say that. Nothing like that is written anywhere in the Scripture. So let's stop making up lies and let's just believe the Word of God as it's written. From the, beginning that the, that from the beginning of the church, from the first day that the church of Jesus Christ, the New Testament, began to exist, Peter, the chief apostle, who had been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, who preached the same gospel as all the other apostles, 
began to preach as Jesus commanded him and all the apostles, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Period. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is how a person gets saved. This is how a person becomes a Christian. If you are born again, then you can obey this gospel and be saved. If you're not born again, then you have no idea what I'm talking about. You probably didn't even make it to this point in the video. But if you're born again, if you're born of God, you're born of His Word, you have this Word in you, you have His Word abiding in you, and you hear it when it is spoken to you, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. And this message has either pricked your heart if you haven't been baptized in Jesus' name yet, so that you will be searching the Scriptures now to find out whether these things that I say are so, or if you are saved, if you have obeyed the gospel of Christ, this message has served to edify you and strengthen you in, in the way of understanding so that you have a greater, broader understanding of the things that are going on around you regarding the people in the various churches who profess to be Christians and who all uh, say that they're Christians but spin lies and refuse to acknowledge the truth and desire to draw you out into, into foolish arguments. And always remember, I'm going to say this in closing, uh, uh, Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Don't get caught up in useless, drawn-out arguments with people that can't hear the Word of God. If someone can't hear the Word of God, it doesn't make any difference whether you shout it, type it in all capital letters, explain it again. It doesn't make any difference. If they can't hear it, then it's not going to do you any good to continue trying to convince them of it. So a man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. This message I give you in love, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting that this is going to be used of God to edify many of you, to build up many of you, and to draw others of you unto the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as always, I remain here for you. You're welcome to communicate with me by making a comment in the comment section or by writing me at my email address, which is always below in the information box. I'm here for you. I live to serve you. I live to feed the sheep. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm still breathing. That's why I'm in my office doing what I'm doing right now. I love you in Jesus' name. And, uh, and I'm here for you if you have a need, if I can be of service to you in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Having said that, I digress. I'm out for now. This is Brother Quentin. Peace.